as well. It's a good Sunday. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, my rock and redeemer. Amen. Stories are important. I heard a story on NPR that explained that our first memories become memories because they are stories that we have been told over and over again. I know that is true for me. One of my first memories is becoming a big sister when I was about three years old. And I know I remember this because my mom and my grandma have told me about it often. They, told, they tell about replacing my I'm the little sister with a I'm the big sister shirt. Um, they told me about my insistence on naming my sister George. Even when they would tell me, but Amy, the baby is a girl, I would say, George is a girl's name. They named her Jenna anyway. Um, and they told me about the first time she came home and I'd been with my grandma. And my mom and dad walked in and my mom was holding Jenna and I rushed over and wanted to pull her down to get a good look. And I heard for the first of probably many times, Amy, remember to be gentle. We remember what we are told. We remember things not just because we experience them, because we continue to talk about them. And we are shaped by the stories we tell. I think every family, every friend group have stories that they tell over and over again. Stories that they tell even though everyone was there and knows the stories. Because these stories are the ones that make them laugh. These are the stories that bring us together. And we are formed by these stories we tell. These are the stories that make us sisters, our friends, our believers. We hold these stories that we tell dear. Today we start a sermon series um, in which we're taking a look at some of the old stories, some Old Testament stories that we hold dear. And we are looking at these stories because we know that these stories are stories that shape us. That in these biblical stories, they tell us about what it is to be faithful people and how we are called to live. I realize when you first hear the story of Daniel, a story of a Jewish exile trying to live out his faith amid the threat of a lion's den, well, it seems to have very little to do with our lives. But when we hear this story of a story of holding on to hope and wondering if God is there in the midst of trouble, well, then I think that's a story we all need to hear and to hold on to. Whether the story of Daniel is old or new to you, I think a little background information is helpful as we explore this story. As I said, Daniel was a Jewish exile. He was living under Persian rule. This means that while Daniel was born in Jerusalem, he was taken into captivity with many others when the kingdom of Judah was defeated. This was a strategy of ruling empires, to scatter people, to take them away from their homelands, it made them easier to control and less likely to revolt. So Daniel was carried away from home and he was trained in the king's court and then he was eleva elevated to a high rank. And he served first in the Babylonian and then in the Persian kingdom. But even with his success in these kingdoms, Daniel continued to focus on his Jewish faith. This was not an easy thing. I can only imagine the challenges these Jewish exiles faced in their struggle to be faithful while living under an oppressive occupation. They were living away from their temple, away from the traditions and rituals of their faith. I imagine that Daniel and those living in exile had to wonder, is God there? Was God still there after Jerusalem had been defeated and the temple was destroyed? Was God still there without the temple, the festivals, the practice of the faith? Was God there in this very strange place? And were they still God's people so far away from the promised line? While there is a pit of lions coming, I truly believe hope is the most important thing in this story. Because amid all of those challenges I just listed, these exiles continue to hold on to hope, continue to believe that God indeed was there. 
And they learned to hold on to hope by telling and recording their story. Stories are important. And stories are especially important when you are trying to remember who you are. So much of the Old Testament was recorded and written down in exile because they needed to hold on to these stories. They held on to hope and faith by telling the story, by reminding them of all the times that God was there, that God was there when they were chosen a people, that God was there when they were liberated from Egypt, that God was there rising up King David and making them a great nation. They held on to faith and hope by remembering all the times that God was there. And they held on to faith and hope by continuing to turn to Jerusalem, continuing to pray, continuing to hope that God would hear them. As I mentioned, Daniel was risen to this high elite position in the kingdom. He was also greatly fear favored by the king Darius. There were many around him who were jealous and envious of Daniel, those who wanted to bring him down. So they plotted together and they said, the problem is Daniel, he has no weak spot. There's no complaints about him. There's no signs of corruption. He is always faithful in his duties. But then they thought there is one thing. There is one thing about Daniel. One thing that makes him different and that is his faithfulness to his God. That was the weak spot. So they went to the king, and I'm sure they flattered him. They said, everyone agrees that this should be a law. This is a great idea. We we'll make a law that whoever prays to anyone, God or human, except for you, king, in the next 30 days, they will be thrown in a den of lions. This, of course, sounded great to King Darius, so he signs it. And these men wait to trap Daniel. And it doesn't take very long. Daniel continues to pray three times a day facing Jerusalem, and we hear he does it right by an open window. And I can never quite tell if this move is foolish or bold. I always think Daniel could have found a space maybe a little less conspicuous, a little less in the open to keep praying without getting himself in trouble. When I heard this story as a kid, when I read about Daniel's open defiance, I thought Daniel was so sure that God would keep him safe that he risked praying at the open window. But now I realize that Daniel couldn't have lived through all he lived through the fall of Jerusalem in exile without knowing that a faithful life does not guarantee a long life. No, I think instead that Daniel was certain, was not certain that God would keep him safe, but instead he had learned or decided that more important than saving his life was how he lived his life. It seemed for Daniel that there were things more important to be than being compliant. Or in the words of the Christian band, lost and found, Daniel had realized while the lions could eat his body, they could not swallow his soul. Daniel knew he needed to stay faithful. Prayer is the way in which we orientate ourselves toward God and away from everything else that seeks our allegiance. So Daniel continued to turn to, faith, to face Jerusalem, orientating not just his body, but his life towards God. It was Daniel's way of saying that while he lived and worked for the Persian Empire, he served only God. Prayer was and is resistance against all those forces that want to claim our allegiance. Prayer is the way we center our lives around those things that matter most. Daniel had already lived through the fall of his home, the kingdom of Judah. He had lived through the rise and fall of the Babylonian Empire, and he now lives under Persian rule. He had learned that human kingdoms will rise and fall. So he turns to God in prayer and puts his hope not in any human power or kingdom, but instead in the kingdom of God. It is a powerful reminder for us. Luckily, we will not and do not face the persecution that Daniel lived under, but we do always have forces that want our allegiance, that compete for the number one spot in our life. And when we feel the urge to turn to those other things, whether they be success or status, money or power, comfort or relationships, 
we reorient our life by turning away from those temptations and instead turning to prayer and turning towards God. Of course, by boldly continuing to pray, Daniel is quickly in trouble. And we hear that the king is so troubled when he heard about Daniel, that the law he made would cause the brutal death of his favorite, upset the king. But even though he was so upset, he is unable or unwilling to change the law. When most needed, powerful King Darius is powerless. And he turns to the same hope that Daniel is carrying, that God will be there. We hear as Daniel is put in the pit of lions, the king can neither eat nor sleep that night. And he rushes out to the lion's pit in the next morning and asks Daniel, was your God able? This rushing out to the pit and calling for Daniel and seeming to expect an answer shows that Darius had a pretty good idea that God is able that he had learned from Daniel that hope in God does not disappoint. And Daniel proudly proclaims that God has sent an angel to shut the mouth of lions so that he was able to make it through the night safely. In the midst of the terror of the lion's den, God is there. Things like faith and hope, they can be scary, risky business, as we talked about in the children's sermon. After all, Daniel's faith and hope in God did not save him from the lion's den. We sometimes, at least I sometimes, want faith to do that very thing, to promise us a life without so much pain and suffering and scary things. But the promise we hold is not in a faith that we can escape suffering, but instead, the promise we hold is that in our suffering, God is there. That just as God was with Daniel in the lion's den, sending an angel to keep him safe, God is there in the struggles and the scary situations that we face. In the midst of pain and suffering, we put our hope in God to be there. And this hope does not disappoint. And those angels that God sends, that angel that closed the mouth of lions to keep us safe, so often that angel is all of you. I think one of the biggest blessings of Gloria Day is the way this congregation cares and supports one another. As an associate pastor of congregational care, I often get a front row seat to this care that usually happens in the background. One of my roles is to facilitate the prayer team and I love that whenever someone comes to me with a prayer request, I get to be able to assure them that there will be so many prayers lifted up for them. That almost 200 people will be turning to God and lifting up the prayers that they're carrying. And this is amazing. And what's even more amazing is that all the other care that comes from these prayer requests. When I send out an email, people often respond back and they say, hey, I know someone who works in this area of this health concern. Can I connect them? Can I help get them more support? Or they say, would it be okay if I contacted them? Because I've been through this too and I need them to know that they are not alone, that we can walk through this together. So much care so often comes from this simple email. And that is just one of the ways this congregation cares for others. Care happens in so many ways, by the food that is brought to neighbors after sickness or to a family after a new baby. Care happens in our groups that gather to support each other in similar struggles. Care happens when we notice someone is new and we say, hey, come have breakfast with me today. As Pastor Chris mentioned today, our congregational care team Congregational members who lead us in caring and serving one another is a, are, are serving breakfast today, and they're also available along with myself and our faith community nurse, Jessica Cruz. We are all around after worship, and we would love to talk to you about the many ways care happens at Gloria Day. We'd love to hear about the ways we can help care for you, and we'd love to connect you with ways that you can help care and support others. Because when we care for others, this is how we proclaim to others that God is there. God is there when we are in need, 
And we as faithful people get to be the signs of God's presence and get to be the face of God's love. Stories are important. Stories shape us. And as we have been shaped by the story of Daniel, we know that we are shaped by a God who shows up in the most unlikely places, in lion's dens and in empty tombs, and right in the midst of our own broken and messy lives. So knowing that this is our story, the story of a God who will never forsake us and be with us in every challenge we face, knowing that this is our story, we find the strength to go out and share God's presence and love with all. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for your promise, for the assurance that you will be there in the midst of every suffering and setback we face. Help us to show up and support others. Help us to be the hands and feet of your presence to let them know that you are there. Amen. We will